So, okay. Sorry, one second. Oopsie. Um, yeah. So, what is biomimicry? I don't know if, um, because I cannot see you, and I was going to ask if you know how the word, uh, what does the word mean? Uh, but as you, as you can uh, assume, it comes from ancient uh, Greek word, which is uh, uh, vios, and uh, which, okay, one second. Um, yeah, let me move this one here. Uh, which means uh, life and mimesis, which means to imitate or to copy. And uh, if you put those two words together, it means how you can um, mimic nature and life. So what is it? Uh, basically, it's a practice that learns and mimics nature and uh, tries to solve uh, human design uh, challenges and find hope along the way. And that is a quote that I borrowed from the Biomimicry Institute. Um, so there are three types of uh, biomimicry. Uh, one, the simplest one is the one that it copies the form or a shape that you find in nature. Either it is a animal, it is a plant or anything in uh, nature. The second one that is, uh, it is a copying of a process like uh, photosynthesis or even more complex uh, processes. And uh, the third one, it's on a bigger scale and it's mimicking uh, at an ecosystems uh, level, like building a nature inspired city. So the way it's been structured, uh, I'm gonna give a sample uh, for different categories. So from the biomimicry was always uh, fascinating and has always inspired people throughout the centuries. What you see here in the two images the, on the left hand side is the Nautilus shell and then on the right hand side is the staircase in the Arc de Triomphe so in Paris, so which was built uh, back in the Napoleonic time. So, and when did it all start? So there are loads of um, histories out there you know saying when did it start so i'm just gonna make a starting point for this presentation from the egyptian uh, pyramids so there are so many stories about the pyramids who did it or how they were built but one of uh, believable let's say stories is that uh, they imitate the mountains and that's where the shape comes from and next one about uh, 4,000 years uh, ago, it's uh, about the umbrella. And that was in uh, China. And uh, the guy who invented the Chinese umbrella, he did it by observing the children uh, that they were carrying the lotus leaf, trying to shield themselves from the rain. So he got inspired by the flexibility and the lightweight of the leaf. And he wanted to uh, interpret it in a, on its own way to create his own product. And the first umbrella that was built back then by this guy, it was made out of silk. Uh, another uh, example throughout the centuries is uh, in ancient Greece and the story of Icarus and uh, Daedalus, which is the son and the father, that they were imprisoned in uh, Crete, in the island of Crete. So Daedalus, who was uh, an engineer himself, he came up with the idea of, for their escape to mimic the birds. So basically he uh, manufactured uh, wings made out of feathers and in order to put them together, he used wax. So he asked his son Icarus uh, when he put the wings on not to go too close to the sun because of the wax. But Icarus didn't listen to his dad and he fell into his death because he went too close to the sun and the sun melted the wax. But the whole idea is that it's in, they were inspired by the birds. And uh, in the medieval times, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, he was really fascinated. Uh, and there are numerous of sketches of the bone structure of birds and also of bats and that they were informing his um, flying machines. And a bit more recent, 
history is the Velcro, which I'm going to talk, uh, it's one of the examples I'm going to give. So I'll speak, I'll talk about it in uh, detail. And then in the 1990s is the bullet train in Japan. So the first, uh, the previous version, let's say, of the bullet train, uh, it was making too much noise when it was going through the tunnel. So there was a boom uh, 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 sound uh, and the neighbors around the tunnels, they were complaining that uh, there is, uh, they cannot put up with this noise. So the chief engineer uh, came up with the solution by observing one of his hobbies, basically, which was the kingfisher. And the kingfisher is a kind of a small bird, but it has a big beak. And um, he was observing how the kingfisher goes into the sea to get its uh, prey. So when he was in the redesign process, he took this on board, uh, the shape of the head of the kingfisher, to um, solve the problem of the front of the train. And uh, it was a success and the whole, because then it was cutting through the sound rather than uh, making this uh, awful sound. So the neighbors, they didn't complain. The next one is in, uh, it's an architectural example. It's a building in uh, Zimbabwe. It's the Eastgate uh, center. So this one imitates the, it's a functional way of how the termite uh, mounts uh, work. So with um, a, and the whole idea behind it is to open and close the building and the openings depending on the amount of air and ventilation they need uh, in the building. It's a shopping mall and an office. So and the way it's been uh, designed, the energy savings are amazing and it only consumes about 10% of uh, what um, uh, another building uh, of the same size and the same location would uh, consume. And the uh, uh, most recent one is about the circular economy and the biomimicry and how it has informed it. But again, this is something that Cleopatra is going to take you through. So I'm just going to leave it here just as a concept. So the first one is uh, for the product design, uh, Velcro. So that was a total accidental um, um, uh, innovation, let's say, and this uh, uh, Swiss engineer, when he was uh, walking in the Swiss Alps, he just uh, noticed that after their hunting and everything, uh, these small bears, they were stuck into the clothes uh, and into his clothes and uh, the fur of his dogs. And, um, and that is the whole idea about this specific seat. It is supposed to stack because uh, it is supposed to stack so that it can travel long distances before germinating. So then it can spread into a wider area. Um, so the George the Menstrel, what uh, he did was to try to study why this is happening. And then he realized that there are lots of uh, hooks on this uh, plant. So, and that what gave him the idea of, of course, many attempts to try to, to master it. Uh, of uh, what we have the Velcro now, which is about the hooks on one side and the loops on the other side and how they come together and how many applications it has resolved this uh, Velcro nowadays. And the next one is uh, again a product, but more for the interior design. So this is a sofa uh, that the designer is calling it sofa so good. And uh, it's been inspired. So this one, it uh, basically mimics this product, both the shape and also the um, mechanisms of uh, nature. And these are the silkworm cocoons and the spider webs. So it does look like a cocoon, and it's very nice apparently to sit there. But at the same time, it at the same time it's a very strong uh, stru structure and very lightweight. So you know the whole. Um, engineering of the web is uh, into place. It is also a 3D printed uh, product and it has used about 60,000 layers of uh, resin material, which makes it very, very strong. Um, uh, the more the layers, the stronger the product, but at the same time, very light. Um, next one is uh, a sampling for architecture. So 
And this one is, uh, there are loads of uh, examples out there, but I just picked the one that it's uh, close to here to Dubai and it's the Burj Khalifa. Uh, probably most of you know or have heard that uh, the tower's design was inspired by a um, regional uh, desert flower, uh, which is called the spider lily and is known for its long petals that it uh, exceeds its core. So as you can see in the two images, you know, on the left being the, lily, the spider lily and then on the right, on the top of the Burj Khalifa, it kind of imitates this sort of uh, idea. Um, next one, again on architecture, but it's more on the facade, is a solar, solar leaf, uh, bioreactive uh, facade, which was uh, like, a, it was a pilot uh, project uh, in uh, Germany uh, in 2013. So these uh, vertical uh, uh, facades, um, it's like a double skin facade basically uh, they gen and they have algae in one layer so basically they generate renewable energy from the biomass from algae and solar, ther solar thermal heat and also because they are on the outer layer of the building they also act as a shading uh, device which is um, a dynamic shading because the more daylight available, the more the algae grows and the more the shading is, uh, uh, is the benefit. Uh, it was a combination, a collaboration of, um, in the industry, this uh, project uh, between Arab, which is an engineering company, the science consult of uh, Germany and called International. So it just shows that when there is a collaboration, we can have uh, quite amazing things uh, in uh, engineering. On a similar uh, note, is the but more recent, is uh, Biotech Playground. This uh, playground is located in Poland, in uh, Warsaw, and uh, it's one of the most polluted cities uh, in Europe, uh, Warsaw. So the designers, they wanted to solve this problem by using, again, the mechanics behind the algae uh, to create to uh, air purifier for these children's uh, playground. So in order to operate these uh, tubes in the facade, they're using two sources of energy. And this is the solar energy and the kids' uh, kinetics because they have these bubbles uh, on the ground where the kids step on it and they operate. It's a fantastic, fantastic project. So I'll show you the video um, and I hope you will enjoy it as much as I do. I just love this one. Um, it, uh, one second. Yeah. Uh, I hope you can all see it. Uh, yeah, one second. Um, yes, so that was about the playground. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, the next application is on the construction industry about the 3D printing and how we can use uh, biomimicry to imitate or solve some of the issues. So uh, I'm not sure if you're all aware about it, but now it's a big uh, discussion in the construction industry uh, where I come from 
uh, as uh, for the 3D printing, uh, as it uh, reduces the cost quite a lot. It's a very sustainable, less waste. Uh, so there are lots of good things about 3D printing, but still it's a new technology and there are quite a few unsolved uh, elements to it. So in principle, that's why I put it there. The 3D printing uses uh, what you find in nature, you know, which is the layering, like um, uh, the abalone cell, which is all about uh, laying materials one on top of the other, additive printing. The only issue at the moment, as it's a kind of new technology, is that the materials that it's been used, they could be, and the glues, they are not the most uh, um, healthy ones, let's say. So maybe uh, there is a potential that we can find a solution uh, by looking in the nature's uh, 3D printers, which is the web, the spider, and the silkworm, and try to be inspired of how they do it. So, and I have borrowed um, this quote from uh, Janine uh, Benius, uh, who is uh, one of the ambassadors and uh, founders of the biomimicry in the US. So, because na nature uses uh, life-friendly chemistry, which is non-toxic and water-based, and which does not require high heat, because the 3D printing at the moment does require high heat during the production. So, a next application of biomimicry, it's uh, on the installation level. And again, uh, I'm gonna borrow one of the most recent examples. I don't know whether you've been to the expo, uh, but in the sustainability uh, pavilion outside, they have the energy trees. So there are about 18 of those. And the whole idea is that they provide the shading and they mimic as well the shape of the uh, uh, regional tree, the gaff tree. And uh, they also generate electricity because they have PVs uh, on, um, on the top. And the next one is about the circular economy. Um, it's an old project that it happened in 2003 that they were calling it from cardboard to caviar. And it's quite fascinating. It was in the UK. So, and it just shows how the loop is closed and there is no waste, there is nothing because uh, that's the whole idea. I mean, uh, Cleopatra is going to talk to you about uh, the circular economy and the biomimicry is just an introduction to this uh, project. Uh, there is no waste in the natural way of how um, life out there happens. So in this uh, project, they had the waste cardboard boxes from uh, local businesses that they were shredded and then they were given to the farms in order to be used as horse bedding. And then when the stables were cleaned out, this uh, waste was fed into the worms. And then these worms that they were quite fat, they were fed to the sturgeon, which was then was producing the caviar. So it just shows how beautiful nature is being uh, done. So I'm going to pass you over to Cleopatra about the circular economy and how it can connect with the biomimicry. <clears throat> Hello, thank you, Irini. Well said. Thank you as well, the organizers from Dubai Nature History Group that connect us all, Valerie, Alex, Irini, Gary, everybody. Uh, my name is Cleopatra Lamadariotto. I'm the founder of Biomimicry Greece and also the movement for Biomimicry for Humanity. Um, before I start about circular economy and biomimicry, I would like to tell you that 10 years ago I used to live in Dubai, so I'm, I miss nature. So I found nature in Dubai desert that is very beautiful and peaceful. And um, uh, during our life, we, we are trying to have uh, nature as mentor uh, because it has wisdom and also nature has beauty. If we dive deep into beauty, we can see the patterns and shapes behind even the Dubai desert, behind the, a flower is a beauty, a sacred geometry and mathematics and all these shapes has a code. So when we see beauty, we connect deep with ourselves. So this is what happened to me. I see beauty and I connect deep with ourselves. If we lose beauty, we lose the deep meaning of life and our existence. Beauty reminds us about the reason 
why we live and why we exist and how to connect to ourselves, to nature, to other people, even to the stars. And uh, it's amazing that we need to understand that everything is connected and we are all connected. So um, now we have to explain to you about how circular economy and biomimicry connect. And by circular economy is a, a biomimetic bio framework. Uh, it's a system and uh, we, we are trying to mimic the system of nature. So what we normally everybody of us uh, is doing, just we, we buy something, you know, materials, everything, even from the supermarket, we use it and then we waste it. This model cannot work anymore because um, everything is not for, uh, it doesn't exist for, for, you know, for an infinity. So we need to use everything wisely. Um, so we need to move from the linear economy to the circular economy. So the circular economy, it says we, we have to take a product, use it, and then not to put it back to the environment and create uh, pollution or any other problems. We need to reuse this, uh, this material. Even if it is food or even if it is raw materials, we can recycle it, we can uh, repair it, or we can use it for, for the next 10 years to find models and new ways to use it for the next years. And then the next slide, please. Um, I think we have some examples in order to understand what happened uh, in the years to come. Uh, circular economy starts it's from Ellen MacArthur. She was a sailor, like all of you. I, I heard from the team that some of you are doing sailing. She was sailing in the middle of the sea, and she realized she couldn't, um, you know, she couldn't use all the materials forever because she was in the middle of the sea. So she has to use circularity. So when she go back after sailing, she start thinking about that. So she, she create the circular economy model. Um, and all the movement, Ellen, Ellen MacArthur circular economy. So here we have some examples about IKEA, Second Life. It's a company, everybody knows it, that uh, when some materials um, uh, is, is not you know, correct, some furniture uh, has a damage, it's not going to throw it back to nature or to the, the environment, repair those uh, furniture, and then they can sell it cheap to as a Second Life. And um, this movement is going very good in some countries. And the other example is from a company, a German company, Loffler, that I find it very interesting that um, they make this kind of office chairs. They sell it quite expensive, but they say that the, they guarantee that this chair is going to live for 30 years. So they give you a guarantee for 30 years. So they don't care to, to sell a thousand of chairs. They, they want to, to, to sell something very valuable for, for the, a good product. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, I, I cannot, yes. Um, so after um, the, the last years, especially after 2015 in Europe, they were trying very hard all European countries to create circular cities and also to have strategies in circular economy. Also in Dubai and uh, even the government, uh, they have a strategy and also they have an action plan that starts uh, the last years. So I think it's uh, at the beginning, but it's going very well. So um, circular cities, it's cities that they are sustainable cities, that they use in solar glasses, uh, they use sustainability, how to create food, uh, how to live with the quality of life. And this is an example from region villages in um, in Holland, that this model they're trying to, to promote it to, to their, their other countries. Um, yes. Um, before we close, Irini was in charge for a um, City Nature Challenge in, uh, in Dubai. It was a global movement and I was in charge for a City Nature Challenge in some other cities and in Athens. It's a global movement that starts from the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles and also the National Geographic is part of the team. So what they are trying to do is to observe, to, to put nature and com community people from every country to observe nature and take photos and then upload it on the platform. This uh, starts in, movement starts in 2016. It's growing and hopefully next year Irene is, is starting to, 
to raise awareness to the UAE and Dubai and to to get, in order to get involved more people in this on those actions and um, also to observe and see beauty in, in Dubai and you know to upload all these strange photos and more people can see. Um, also, we are a part of uh, Biomimicry for Humanity, Irini, and uh, it's uh, also a team member of uh, Biomimicry for, for Humanity. We created uh, through a European project. I'm the founder of that, and um, we are trying to raise awareness to more people how to reimagine humanity and our planet, to find solutions to global challenges and problems, and to take actions because we cannot be pathetic anymore to what happened to nature and environment. Um, also, our goal is. Um, uh, to create more projects like nature-based nature -based, uh, solution projects, solar industry projects, circular economy and biomimicry startups, and also to raise awareness to more people to understand that every species has a reason to exist, so everybody is valuable in this uh, planet. Also, with biomimicry, we want to teach people to design with new uh, mindfulness design, with responsibility, with the circular economy model responsibility as well. Um, we need to analyze all these ideas and strategies and find solutions in every problem that human has or every city. And before I finish, nature has an intelligence more than 3.8 years, uh, million of, billion of years. So um, we need to use this intelligence if we want to be wise like nature and also to, to keep her as a mentor before we design, think or act. And thank you again. I hope you enjoy it. And thank you, Rini, that connect us all and the organizers. Yeah, so thank you, Cleopatra. And that brings us to the Q&A. If there are any questions for, for us, please let us know. Um, am I supposed to see the question somewhere? Because Hello. Oh, wait. Hi, Irene. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Michelle. Yes. Leslie was mentioned something about a. Uh, um, he mentioned about. Have you heard about three D printing as a potential way of recycling used plastics? And he was also asking about a sonic boom. Hold on have heard about 3D printing as a potential way of recycling used plastics. Hmm, I'm not aware of this one, to be honest. Uh, to use it, uh, you mean as a, as a material, right? Yeah. As the, in the machine, that's what you feed in, the recycled plastic, in order to build something out of it. I know, for example, at the uh, one and only um, Royal Mirage, one of the, not the one and only Royal Mirage, their, their boutique hotel on the Palm, all their, um, their gangways are made, for, looks like wood, but they're actually made from recycled plastic. So they're making a lot of sort of planks that look like wood, but it's actually recycled plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using it quite widely in Dubai. Um, Angela Manthorpe says, can you please go back to the links of the last page so that people can take a look at them? Um, yeah, sure. a lot of links. Yeah. Yep. Uh, for sunglasses, using used uh, ground coffee. Oh wow! I'll uh, I'll Google this one. I didn't know about that. For the sunglasses. Okay. I have, I don't know any, uh, has anybody got any other questions? I haven't seen anything else coming through. You can see it in the chat, Irene. Yeah, okay, uh, one second. I don't see so, any. Think so, uh, can, what, what? can you please discuss how biomimicry and circular economy correlate with the climate crisis? Um, yes, um, because 
feel we want to create, for instance, we can create a lot of materials that protect uh, fluid or protect from fires that uh, circulate. It's materials that protect environment. And um, now there are a lot of companies that are trying to create a lot of startups and a lot of actions in uh, climate change. And also a lot of organizations uh, are trying very hard for that. Um, the thing is, uh, they're trying to create new models. At, at the moment, every we, there are about 4 million business circular economy models, and there is a massive actions until 2030, as we need to make a lot of things in order to, you know, to, to save uh, the planet and also to prevent from climate change. From nature-based solutions, a lot. A lot of action with nature-based solutions and climate change. You can take, I think we don't have a, um, a reference here, but we can send it to you by email if you wish. Yeah, that would be good. I think you could share that with us and then we could send it on to the group. I could let Valerie share it. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. um, Stephen Alenda says, have you heard of alternative materials other than fossil fuels as a basis for plastic used? Um. I don't know. I'm not aware of it. In uh, alternative materials other than fossil fuels, for in, instead of to let's say for recycled plastic, for let's say the tires, so things that you can do with plastic but you are not using plastic. There is a big thing about uh, tires at the moment. I was watching another video from the World Economic Forum. Uh, earlier and uh, in Nigeria apparently they have done this uh, amazing initiative that they are recycling I don't know how many thousands of uh, tires and uh, they are producing elements that it looks like plastic but it's not plastic but it's instead of plastic and other uses they also use it for uh, children's playground and for uh, under the surfaces for the infrastructure work, you know, for the beddings and everything. So you don't necessarily have to see all of them. Um, is this what we are, um, what is this question about? It might be in other alternatives to the, uh, to the fuel industry. Um, uh, like renewable energy or you see with the, <laughs> with the Zoom, you don't have this um, connectivity with uh, whoever has the question. Yeah. Okay, the next one is um, 3D printing. There is a building next to Dubai Emirates Tower mm -hmm. that's 3D printed. These comments are from Alexis. Alexis says there's a building next to... Yeah, yeah, it's the first one that was uh, built. Uh, it's fantastic, this uh, foundation there. Um, yeah, so Dubai, and there are also targets for Dubai. For the 3D printing, they have published their targets of how much uh, of their construction they want it to be 3D. So, but the only issue with the three, not only issue, there are other issues as well, but one of the issues is the glues and how you bring everything together. So that's why I wanted to make a point of it that maybe since it's at its early stages, we can experiment a bit by learning from nature so that they're non-toxic and a bit more uh, healthier alternatives rather than the, re the resins and everything that it's been used at the moment. And then again, coming from, uh, um... Stephen Alendi says the idea of moving away from disposability and waste as the worst aspects of recent society, anything used should have a further life as another usage instead of going to a landfill where it just sits unchanged for decades and centuries. And yeah, 100%. And not only that, you know, especially with the tires, or just because I mentioned it before, it's uh, in climates uh, like uh, Nigeria, uh, well, hot climates. Uh, it's a big risk for fires as well, you know, when you're disposing them like that, the tires and uh, the materials that are out of, uh, that they're made out of, you know, they're easily to inflammable and the toxins that they're going to release in the environment and the pollution is uh, out of this world. So it's a bit more complex, the problem of so much waste around us. Yeah, and then um, from Alexis, he says, right, recycling used plastic bottles into which are which recycling the box crushes into um, very fine glass, which can be used as an alternative to sand in certain construction building acts. Yeah, yeah, and also with the 
uh, recycling glass bottles. You can also make, you can, you can use, you reuse some of the glass bottles as well, you know. So I have seen some um, amazing uh, screens uh, for uh, design, from a design aspect, you know, as an interior element that you can make some very nice uh, screens out of it. Just needs a bit of imagination and everything. So, yeah, Alexis is very much into it. Eh? Yeah, and then we had Steve and Alain <laughs> having the 3D printing that was, I think it has been uh, hemp based suggested. It has been so what? Hemp, I don't think hemp based suggested. I'm not quite sure what he... Mm, not too sure if... Uh, yeah, and then Heidi Strakesma said this was an extremely in interesting and an eye and eye opening for me. You mentioned the Burj Khalifa as an example out of interest. What other kind of buildings ha here have a similar concept using nature for design other than metro stations? Um, let's say architecturally, uh, let's say Gaudi. Um, I just try to think of something that most of the people we know. Uh, do you know Gaudi, the Spanish architect uh, with the Sagrada Familia? And yeah. So he was uh, inspired by nature. Also, um, another Spanish, <laughs> Santiago Calatrava, he's also uh, inspired by birds and the uh, wings and the mechanics behind it to representing the buildings. Um, other ones, let me think that come into mind. Um, I have to think, but I can share. If um, if you want, I can share some links with the buildings that they have been inspired uh, by nature, oh, as far as the shape is concerned. Okay, I'm going to bring Stephen Allende on because he's got a really long question. And maybe Stephen, I've unmuted you. I've asked you to unmute yourself. Maybe you can ask this about other sources of plastic? I don't think he's heard. Because he's, um, Stephen said, I'm sorry, talking about sources for plastic other than the traditional fossil fuels, which have created so much waste. I heard hemp as a potential alternative source and think other things have also been suggested. So you haven't heard of the usage of hemp? I haven't, no. Uh, right. Sorry. But if he has, then definitely must be out there. I will Google it. Right. Ah. I'm thinking, like, uh, can you hear me now? Sorry, I, I just had to plug my webcam in. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going off the top of my head. I thought I'd heard this a few months ago. I certainly heard about uh, the recycling plastic thing. Um, in a 3D uh, workshop like I was at like last year and it sounded like it was a, a good way of doing things actually taking pre-made plastics breaking them back down into um, component forms then making uh, the 3D is it 3D twine back out of that so you'd wind up printing material that had been pre-used um, I'm not i not the expert on this so like I don't know how clean the ending end result was but it sounded like it was something that people like who were running that workshop had oh, suggested was a viable process oh, um, and it sounds like a great way of getting rid of like so much of the plastic like I mean hearing so much over the last few years of where plastic has gone what damage it's doing to the environment so if you have got a way of breaking it down and reusing it in this way, it would be so useful. Also, the idea of returning to reusing containers, like um, I think like when I was very small, like uh, the milkman brought a glass bottle of milk around to, um, to the doorstep and picked that glass bottle up again. It was refilled and reused for somebody else. That whole idea of getting away from one use plastic would be so useful and to yeah. totally get away from the idea of landfill like uh, you use one thing once and then you bury it in the countryside um it's not a useful way of doing things yeah 
Yes, and thank you so much for sharing. I didn't know about that, uh, about the hem and the 3D printing, but uh, now that you mentioned it, I will Google it. And uh, thank okay. you so much for sharing it because it seems that they have started, uh, you know, a bit of experiments, not going to the uh, more toxic materials, but try to mm -hmm. reuse and everything. And also now that you say about hemp, and bamboo, um, uh, you must have seen, you know, as well, you know, lots of uh, cutleries and uh, right, yeah, pieces yeah. and everything, you know, they're trying to reuse also fabrics, uh, towels and clothes. Yeah, they that do was, have, uh, uh, that was another thing I was going to say, like uh, fast fashion, like uh, getting away from the idea of uh, disposable fashion. Uh, the idea that I put forward in that, like um, you always have a secondary use for any item you use. So like you have, initial use of um, fabric as whatever item of clothing, then it becomes patching, then it becomes rag, then it becomes whatever. So it's been used to the point that it's actually falling apart rather than it getting used and then just being disposed of. Yes, and actually, you know, that's what um, H&M, now they have put this initiative on and another brand, I don't know, uh, brand anyway, it's in the UK, the Primark, you know, which is right. the most, uh, most fast fashion, you know, I have ever seen. And, you know, although that's their model at the same time, in order to balance it out, they try to do the same sort of uh, what you just described. So yeah. if you have an old uh, garment or something is not working, you can take it back to them and then they're going to find another user. They will fix it or, you know, they just try to be into this sort of... Uh, um, a philosophy that uh, the garment is not going to end up in the landfill, but it, they will find another use for it, you know, um, to to fix it. And uh, and also for the plastic bottles, I don't know whether you know about this uh, company here in Dubai that they are recycling plastic bottles and they make it um, um, t-shirts. Yeah, t-shirts. Yes. Correct. Yeah, they make uh, the yarn and then they can do any sort of uh, towels, dresses, t-shirts, and they're based uh, here in Dubai. Yeah, now there's another thing, just let me come in here. Heidi Strake's masters in the Netherlands, they have started making handbags from discarded avocados that would have otherwise been thrown away. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've, I've asked Angela to unmute because she came up with a, something about a building. Angela, have you unmuted? I don't really have much more to add than my comment, uh, Michelle, uh, which was that um, a few years ago, I saw a fascinating presentation uh, on the walls at um, Emirates Palace from Zaha Hadid, in which she was had taken inspiration from nature for some of her building designs. I, I don't know if the audience is familiar with Zaha's um, uh, building designs, but um, some of them are very imaginative. And, um, and I just, it, it really struck me, her presentation at the time, you know, in which she was looking at layering the outside of buildings and using nature for inspiration. Uh, but I haven't got really anything more than that to add. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, Zaha is a legend, the, the way you know, she was doing uh, her designs, you know, it was like one and only, you know, very, very, very beautiful things. Um, I cannot think of something that, that comes to my head, you know, that it mimics exactly a form of uh, um, nature, but I'm sure she does because they were very aerodynamic uh, sort of shapes. So, and she was very intellectual in the way she was designing. So I'm sure in her processes and everything, she must have had uh, my biomimicry, you know, uh, underlying her um, designs. Um, okay, I'm going to, I've just asked Alexis to unmute because he has something to say. And then I will hand after Alexis, Gary, and then Valerie. And then I think we'll bring an, a, a, to an end. Alexis, have you, you had some comments in the question. You had something to say. So, yes. I, 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 Come back to me. <laughs> right. No, the problem is I've got two machines connected to this presentation. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. let me 
use just one device. Uh, my comment was going to be uh, twofold. One was uh, on the topic of mangoes being used to make fruit leather, which is then mm -hmm. uh, it's been specially treated in the Netherlands. And I shared some links on the, uh, on the chat. Uh, it's been used to make actually quite robust leather goods, bags or other items. And it's actually a very interesting process that they go through. So it's well worth, I think, uh, mm -hmm. clicking through on the first link. Uh, and then on 3D printing, uh, given the comments, uh, questions made earlier, uh, actually the reuse of plastics is, is, is almost trivial for certain uses of 3D printing. You can chip up, so uh, cut up the, the plastic, certain types of plastic, and then pass that through an extruder, uh, heat applied. And it's something which some of the home DIY 3D printing is capable of doing, so you can, push into your 3D printer uh, your plastic at home. You need to select the plastic because not all plastic will deform well under heat. Certain, will need, certain ones will need different uh, levels of heat. And then of course the use of, use of the 3D printing will differ, uh, your needs will, will implicate your choice of plastic. But yeah, just to say that there are quite a lot of reuses for plastic. I mentioned earlier one for, for glass. And one of the things with the, the glass comments I posted was the use of space for recycling bottles and the weight of those items makes it incredibly uh, costly if you want to, to do it. And if you can find a, a nearby use for the, the salt-like output, it's fantastic. So you can collect a lot more glass in that receptacle, but also you can put it to immediate use in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. There you go, that was my input. Perfect, thank you so much, Alexis. <laughs> and then I think finally Gary had something to say as well. Gary? We have to get to a... Yeah, you put me on the spot uh, <laughs> uh, so that whether I have something to say or not, I will, I will say something. Uh, number one is that uh, listening to all of this, I feel embarrassed because I had uh, my morning coffee from uh, the machine that uses those little Keurig cups, which are uh, notoriously uh, environmentally uh, unfriendly. Uh, it's uh, a legacy uh, here in New York from uh, uh, my mother. Uh, the, the second is that uh, we seem to have morphed uh, uh, a little bit uh, in the end of the discussion from biomimicry to uh, uh, conservation. And that's certainly one of the uh, important uses of uh, biomimicry, but it's not, but, it, but biomimicry per se doesn't have to be uh, environmentally friendly. I go back to the uh, the initial slide uh, showing the uh, the woodpecker and the the hammer handle. And if you continue to make the hammer handle, uh, no, no matter how you shape it, if you continue to make it out of uh, 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 metals and, and so on, it's going to uh, use a lot of energy and not necessarily be environmentally friendly. Although a good, uh, my uh, original geologic hammer uh, lasted, uh, lasted me about uh, 45, uh, 45 years. So, uh, and even then the hammer is still good. The, it was the, the leather hand wrapping that uh, came off. Uh, uh, so there's a connection between uh, biomimicry and conservation, but not a necessary one. The, the, the practical aspects of how nature did things are uh, intriguing for uh, for their own sake. And of course, we all know that nature didn't necessarily do things in the most efficient way. Uh, one reason we have in our in our hands the number of bones we have in our hands and wrists and so on is because that's the number of bones that the first fish that uh, slopped its way up out of the mud and on land had in its uh, 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 four uh, uh, appendages. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, 
This was, uh, thank you, thank you all for an extremely uh, uh, interesting and uh, thought provoking uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I guess I, with, with that, I'm going to uh, turn you back over to, uh, to Valerie. Nice to, it's, it's nice to be able to participate from uh, around the world. Thank you, uh, Gary. Valerie, are you online? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you both very much, Cleopatra and Irene. It's most thank excellent you, Valerie, lecture you. and very interesting, really worth, well, worth listening to. So thank you very much again for putting it all together. We, everybody's enjoyed it with so many questions. Um, I just to remind people, everyone, about the November lecture on the 7th of November which in fact, if I read it out to you, is um, Surviving Ingenious Strategies Without Legs, Plants Tackle This by Adopting Ingenious Strategies to Survive. So with that, thank you once again to our speakers and we'll look forward to seeing you all again in November. Thank you so much for having us and uh, we really enjoyed it as well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Cleopatra. I'm going to bring the meeting to an end now. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Good night.